Uh, good morning everyone um, and welcome to the University of Stirling. I'm delighted to welcome the Distinguished Chief Medical Officer for Scotland, Sir Harry Burns, to the University. Um, and he's going to uh, deliver the Christmas lecture for the Stirling Institute of People-Centred Healthcare Management. Sir Harry began his career as a medical doctor and for a number of years was a consultant surgeon at Glasgow Royal Infirmary. He subsequently became medical director in the same hospital and in 1993 was appointed director of public health for Greater Glasgow Health Board, during which time he conducted research into the problems of social determinants of health and was instrumental in developing Scotland's first cancer strategy. He became Chief Medical Officer for Scotland in 2005 with responsibility for aspects of public health policy and health protection. He also has policy responsibility for sport in Scotland, so we hope he'll feel at home here at Scotland University for sporting excellence. Here in Stirling we actively contribute to national and international discussion on economic, social, political and cultural developments that benefit communities and societies. The university regularly hosts national policy events with distinguished and influential speakers and today indeed is no exception. This morning's Christmas lecture aims to help the general public, healthcare professionals and others to better understand how the NHS and healthcare around the world can in the face of social determinants of health in poor patients and their communities. Sir Harry is at the forefront of the debate on healthcare in Scotland. As Chief Medical Officer, he has an unparalleled view of the health risks, opportunities and dilemmas facing Scotland. His experience in his early career working with patients in the East End of Glasgow gave him an insight into the complex interrelationships between associate economic status and illness. Sir Harry is a staunch advocate of the assets-based approach to people's health. This focuses on the behaviours, influences and social factors which have an impact on people's health and well-being, especially in their early lives. In a lecture that he gave last year he said, assets is about putting people in control of their own lives and it takes real leadership on the part of public organisations to step back and let that happen, to lead us to a better place in the future. Today he's going to speak to us about assets for health and new approaches for Scotland. So on behalf of everyone here, I'd like to thank you again, Sir Harry, for coming to, to Stirling University and for delivering this Christmas lecture. Thank you. the opportunity to come here. Thanks. I mean, as I always say, it's nice to be here, in fact, as a Glaswegian, it's nice to be anywhere that isn't Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to talk a bit about changing the way in which we interact in society, but before I get into that, I, I want to go into the reasons why I think that's important. Whenever I talk about this south of the border, talk about assets, people in control of their own lives and so on. Some smart aleck in the audience always says, ah, you mean the big society. Well, I don't. Okay. But I want you to understand how I got to that conclusion. And I'm going to go into some of the biology that underpins the thinking of a sense of control being important to our health. The other thing I think might say is that I'm not going to talk about vitamin D. Okay. Those Times readers among you will have picked up the fact that the Scottish editor of the Times yesterday uh, in commenting on my annual report said, how could this blithering, he didn't quite say blithering idiot, but you know, you could tell with my that um, how can you talk about Scotland's health without talking about vitamin D? Well, I'm not going to talk about vitamin D today. Okay? It may have a role to play. But poverty has actually got a much bigger role to play. And it's poverty that first took me into this because 1984 I became a consultant surgeon in the Royal Infirmary in Glasgow where I operated on people who came from these houses. And 
I always show this picture at the start of talks because it, it crystallizes a number of questions. We know when we look at this guy that he's liable to die 10 to 15 years earlier. His life expectancy as a resident of that area is 10 to 15 years earlier than the life expectancy of someone living about five miles northwest of him in Bear's Den. And yet, in all the time I was a clinician there, I never once wrote a death certificate that he died age 60 because he lived in a poor house, or he died because he was unemployed. You die of molecular events. You don't die of social events. And it seemed to me that our explanations of the links between <coughs> social conditions and molecular events were deficient. And until we understood what those links were, we couldn't possibly begin to intervene appropriately. You know, at that time, I assumed it was, well, it was the fags and the booze and the fatty foods. Well, they are proximate causes, but what are the causes of those causes? Why is it that people have addictive behaviors and don't take care of themselves? And until we begin to understand that, we can't intervene. Second point, question that this crystallizes is, this painting murals of corporation buses on a gable end interfere with the molecular events that occur in people's arteries and cells? Well, it might do, but it just seems to me to be an example of one of the many well-intentioned failures that occurred in the 70s and 80s in terms of trying to improve life for people. Ask him what he wants. He probably wants the rubbish cleared up. And he probably wants a job. Yes, civic heart is good, but it's good to do things with people's consent rather than do things to them, like impose that on them. Okay. And the third thing I should mention is that in all the many hundreds of times I've shown this slide, I used to think, well, what would happen if one day this guy's in the audience? <laughs> and then one day it happened. <laughs> I was giving a talk in a business school, and the professor of strategic management in the front row gasped, and he said, that's Acre Hill Street in Black Hill. I was born in those flats, he said. And that raises a really interesting point, because he's turned out a success. That is, if you assume being a professor of strategic <laughs> management. <laughs> but, what was it that allowed him to be a success when so many of his fellow residents of that area died in their 50s and 60s, unemployed and poor? So these were the sort of questions that sparked off eventually a move for me from surgery into public health, and certainly a move that I've never regretted. Now let's try and put Scotland's health in some context. This is life expectancy in about 16 Western European countries, and it goes back 150 years. 150 years ago, Scottish life expectancy is about middle of the average. It remained about middle of the pack all the way up here until about the 1950s. And other Western European countries, Scandinavia, North Europe, Southern Europe, all have progressively increased their life expectancy at a greater rate than Scotland. This is Portugal, this green line. 1950s, Portugal was about 10 years worse off than us. It's now overtaken us. What is it that's different about Scotland? Why is it that Scotland is improving its life expectancy? We keep saying that year on year. Scotland is getting better, but it's not getting better as fast as it should do. And the answer is health inequalities. This is the trend in male life expectancy since the 1950s. That's the trend in life expectancy in the most affluent 20%, the most deprived 20%. Since the 50s, there's been a progressive widening of the gap. If since the 1950s, the poor had kept pace in the rate of growth of life expectancy, as the rich did not even narrow the gap as it was 50 years ago, our life expectancy would be about three or four years better off than it is, and that would put us back to where we were 100 years ago, the middle of the European pack. The problem with Scotland's health, the problem with Scotland's poor health, is the health of the poor. 
It's the socio-economically driven inequalities that we see, which are progressively widening. Now, when you ask, well, what happened in the 1950s that slowed down our rate of growth so dramatically, the explanation we always come up with is unemployment. This is predominantly a feature of West Central Scotland. The eight local government districts whose annual mortality rate is above the Scottish average are Dundee City, Western Isles, and six local government districts on either side of the Clyde, Western Bartonshire, Inverclyde, Glasgow City, all the way around to North Ayrshire. It's a West Central Scotland issue predominantly. And 50 years ago, everyone was employed. And in the space of a few years, all these people were put out of work. Not only were they put out of work, they were given benefits, a house in Drumchapel or Easter House, and society walked away from them. The same thing didn't happen elsewhere. But we tend to oversimplify the issues. We tend to say, well, and as it was said to me many times when I was in Glasgow, politicians in Glasgow would say, if only Glaswegians would stop smoking, we'd be as healthy as anyone. Well, it's not actually true that our problems are all due to smoking. This is a World Health Organization study that looks at teenage smoking rates, 15-year-olds, in every country of the European region of WHO. The study was done about eight or nine years ago. Scottish teenagers are the fifth lowest smokers in Europe. All the countries with higher life expectancies than us are over to the left of that graph. Scottish males in this study carried out a few years later, but before the smoking ban came in, Scottish males were the third lowest smokers in Europe. Scottish females let the charts down a bit, being closer to the European average. <coughs> but we don't have the lowest life expectancy in Western Europe because we have the highest smoking rates. The other explanation is diet, our predilection for fatty foods, many of which are high in vitamin D, I need to say. The country that has radically changed its diet most successfully is Finland. This yellow line shows Finnish heart disease mortality in men under the age of 75. Okay? In the 1960s, Finnish heart disease mortality was about the highest in the world. And they decided they wanted to get saturated fat out of the diet. So they took really strong action. They took all the subsidies away from dairy farming to discourage growth of butter, cheese, <coughs> cream, milk, cake as much saturated fat out of the diet as they could. And they gave the farmers the subsidies back if they'd switch to growing fruit and vegetables. And free salads and free fruit are compulsory by law in schools and workplaces in Finland. And then they stood back and said, my, aren't we clever? But see the pale green line there? That's the Scottish heart disease mortality. Identical to the Finnish one. So the Finns radically changed their diet we radically did absolutely do it all. <laughs> and it made not a damn bit of difference. Well, it made possibly a very slight difference. But it's clear that the driver behind this is something in addition to our diet. How about income inequality and poverty per se? And here the story begins to get really interesting because Glasgow Centre for Population Health has compared three cities in the UK, Glasgow, Liverpool, and Manchester. The three cities are identical in terms of their distribution of income and their gap between the rich and poor income inequality. That's the distribution <coughs> of income across data zones in Liverpool. That's Glasgow, identical, okay? To can't tell them apart, and Manchester's the same. Three cities absolutely united in terms of distribution of income. In Glasgow, mortality rates are 30% higher. What we've got here, the blue dotted line, is the average mortality from these seven causes of death in Liverpool and Manchester. It's virtually the same in both those. 
those cities. And that's standardised mortality rate set at 100. When you look at these causes of death in Glasgow, these bars, standardised mortality rate, what this one is saying is that each year there is a 12% higher risk of a Glaswegian dying of cancer than there is in Liverpool and Manchester. But the really interesting ones are over here. And 60% of the excess premature mortality in Glasgow, which are just identically poor cities in the north of England, 60% of the excess premature mortality is due to drugs, alcohol, suicide, and violence. We're not going to fix that with vitamin D or reducing <laughs> the saturated fat content of the diet. There are deep, deep psychosocial drivers at work here that lead to this increased risk. And in fact, the same drivers, as I'll show you, increase the risk of heart disease and cancer as well. So, where does that take us? Well, it's taken some of my colleagues to some interesting parts of Europe because we said, well, if this is being driven by collapse of traditional industries, dislocation of whole populations from traditional ways of life, shunted out to peripheral housing schemes where they're basically ignored and turned to drink and drugs. Someone produced for me recently a report from the 1970s that said Scotland has no drug problem. This is a relatively recent emergence of huge intakes of alcohol and, and, um, and drugs. So colleagues at Glasgow Centre for Population Health decided to look at other regions of Europe that had the same level of deindustrialization. Places like Limburg, Saxony, the Ruhr, areas in Poland and the Czech Republic against West Central Scotland. And the interesting thing is that the percentage of jobs lost in the 60s and 70s in these areas is virtually identical to the jobs lost in Glasgow. Between 40 and 60 percent across all these areas that are traditional steel making or mining injuries, industries or whatever. These other areas, on the whole, have preserved the rate of growth of life expectancy at a higher rate than in West Central Scotland. And the interesting, really interesting ones are the Eastern European ones. Katowice in Poland, Moravia in the Czech Republic, Saxony in Germany. Flat until 1990, rapid increases. Women in Katowice and Moravia have now overtaken Scottish women in terms of life expectancy. And of course, what happened in 1990? Communism went away. People suddenly got control over their lives again. And that's astonishing. That sudden rise, like a jet airplane taking off. Political change led to dramatic improvements in life expectancy. Now, some of my colleagues over there that I've spoken to about said, oh, we changed our diet, we did all these other things. It wouldn't cause that very rapid reduction in premature mortality. So, <coughs> what's the explanation? <coughs> How, and, and, you know, well, the one thing I've learned is that for every expert in this area, there is a different explanation. And, I, you know, the, this is what the evidence is saying to me, but I am in no doubt that as we gather more evidence, we will find a more complex picture emerging. And I've tried very hard not to oversimplify the picture because it's the, what we're seeing is the health in Scotland is an emerging outcome of a complex social picture. But there were a couple of papers that I came across in the course of this journey that made me sort of sit up and say, Eureka. And the, one of the important ones was this one written by a woman called Susan Everson who went to Finland to study these men at high risk of premature death. She's, seven-year study in which we look very closely at a whole range of different um, factors. And one of the factors she looked at was hopelessness. She had big psychometric testing approach, and she was able to split men into the three groups, those who were very hopeless, those who were moderately hopeless, and those who were just a wee bit hopeless. Because as a woman, she understood that all men are <laughs> <laughs> The men, and, and what I guess she was measuring with this was psychological negativity, pessimism about the future. The men who were most pessimistic were four times as likely to die 
of heart disease as those who are not pessimistic about the future, and two and a half times more likely to die of cancer in the course of her study. And she couldn't explain that by saying, well, they come to drink and bags. Because the statistical analysis, the population size is big enough to allow her to distill out of the analysis hopelessness as an independent driver of adverse outcomes. The really clever thing that she did, however, was to measure the thickness of their arteries. This is a carotid artery ultrasound. The patient's lying in his back, the head's up here, <coughs> the shoulder's down here, common carotid artery coming up. This is the internal carotid going to supply the left side of the brain. And the radiologist has, these two arrows show the radiologist has measured the thickness of a plaque of fat within the lining of the artery. And over the course of our study, she was able to show that men in the most highly hopeless group thickened their arteries faster. They deposited more fat in their arteries than men who were optimistic. And she speculated about the cause of that. And what she said was, well, if you feel pressured and negative about the future, you are likely to elevate stress hormones like cortisol. And what's the function of cortisol? Is to mobilize fat in the bloodstream. If you've got high cortisol for 40 years, perfectly understandable that you might get one or two millimeter thick plaques of fat in your arteries. And that was the eureka moment for me because as a, as a surgeon, my job was to create acute stress in people. That's what a surgical operation is. The stress response is there to repair the body after an operation but it begins to settle down as the wound heals, so it goes away in a week or two. The notion of chronically elevated stress responses was a new one to me. The other guy who was important in this study was this guy, Aaron Antonovsky, an American sociologist who spent the last half of his career in Israel where he studied adults who as children had been in concentration camps. And what he found was that 70% of these adults were very, very unhealthy. And I suppose the conventional way of thinking would be to say, well, what was that about the concentration camp experience that made them unhealthy? Well, that's a stupid question. He turned it around and he said, well, why aren't they all unhealthy? What is it about the 30% that allowed them to survive in a positive physical, mental, and social sense? And he wrote several books about the studies, and I always urge my audiences never ever to attempt to read these books, <coughs> because they are really complicated. So I've distilled them down to a paragraph for you. <laughs> Best book he wrote is a book called Health, Stress, and Coping. Basically, he said that the, the, the thing that allowed children to survive was that before they'd gone into the concentration camps, they'd acquired what he termed was a sense of coherence. And a sense of coherence consisted of three things. First of all, it was the ability to find the world round about you as being structured and predictable. They knew what was going on and they understood what was happening. The second thing was they felt they had the resilience and the internal resources to meet the challenges. And thirdly, they wanted to meet the challenges. And those three things together allowed them cope, to work out what was happening, and to cope with the, what was being done to them. What he said was that unless we can find the social, physical, uh, social and physical environment round about, is it comprehensible, manageable, meaningful, we would experience a state of chronic stress. It was two words again. So we set out to look for evidence of chronic stress in so socially driven chronic stress. Babies exhibited. This is Canadian data. Children in orphanages. The longer a child is separated from a single significant base, the higher its salivary cortisol becomes. Adults. Famous study carried out by Sir Michael Marmot looking at adult stress levels in the civil service. 30,000 civil servants followed up now for about three decades. This is a daytime cortisol profile. It's always higher in the morning, goes down before bedtime at night. 
the profile of lower grade civil servants shows that they are more stressed throughout the day than higher grade civil servants. I keep telling our permanent secretary that permanent secretaries are the healthiest people, <laughs> the stressed people in the civil service. And why is that? Control. If a minister asks a permanent secretary to do something that he doesn't want to do, what does he do with it? Gives it to somebody down the line. Gives it to the next guy down the line, he gives it to the next guy down the line, and then ultimately all the crap no one else wants lands on the desk of the chief medical officer. <laughs> <laughs> point is that control in an occupational hierarchy is a very health enhancing phenomenon. Even at whole country level, Martin Bobak, a colleague at UCL, went round the former countries of the former Soviet Union and asked lots of people how much control did they feel they had over their lives. Control down here, highest levels of control exhibited at the Poles and Czechs, with lowest annual mortality, lowest levels of control in Russians, highest annual mortality, linear relationship between the two. I'm going to ask Martin to bring his clipboard up here and find out where we lie on the sense of control axis. Because that might explain a lot. Now, why is it? What is it about this stress response thing? Why have we got it? Because what we're beginning to say here is that socially determined stress is associated with poor outcome. So in evolutionary terms, what's it for? And it's for catching your food, basically. If you think about it, every animal that we would want to eat can run faster than us, and every animal that would want to eat us can run faster than us, so our survival is a bit problematic, isn't it? The answer is that although they can all run faster than us, we can run further than just about any animal on the planet. The only one so far I've found that defies that rule is the camel. Okay. But I've got a guy starting work with me in February who recently ran from the north of Scotland to the Sahara Desert, 84 marathons in 87 days, so I'm going to find out a bit more about this, whether or not there's a few camels on the way. <laughs> Point is that the reason we can run further than animals is because they have fur and we don't. They overheat when they run. They can sprint off very fast to evade a predator, but they have to stop to cool down. And they cool down by breathing hot air out. They don't sweat. We, on the other hand, can just keep on jogging. And persistence hunters like these Kalahari Bushmen, or like American Indians before they used horses, run their prey to death. American Indians used to run buffalo to death. These guys just jog after the antelope, it runs away, it stops. They just keep jogging, it runs away, it stops. It takes typically four or five hours and about 25 miles, about the distance of a marathon. And the temperature in the animal's muscles reaches a point where the enzymes don't work and it can't run away anymore. Wallop, lunch. Problem is we don't have to chase our food around Tesco's. And we just accumulate all that fat. The cortisol is the hormone that drives the release of fat into the bloodstream for our muscles. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the boss of Tesco. You know how you go on the internet and the wee van brings the food to you? I'm going to get the boss of Tesco to tell his vans not to stop. <laughs> it slows down and you run after it and he chucks the food down. That will get the necessary hormonal response going. So we've, we've got this cortisol elevated, this fatty acid elevating hormone for very good evolutionary reasons. But we also have another system, and this is a really interesting for evolutionary reasons. When you catch the animal, if it's not dead, it might bite you. You need a repair mechanism, and the body's repair mechanism is the inflammatory response. So we measured activation of the inflammatory response in 5,000 Western Scotland men. It doubles as you go down the social scale. Doubles as you go down the social scale. It doubles if you smoke. The chronic irritation, the chronic repair processes in your lungs increases your inflammatory response, and it doubles again if you're obese. So an obese smoker who's poor has a CRP level, C-reactive protein level, eight times higher than a skinny non-smoker who lives in an affluent area. And the significance of that is quite great. 
because it's the inflammatory response, not co uh, cholesterol that causes heart attacks. People think cholesterol causes heart attacks. What cholesterol does is something different. It's deposited in the lining of the arteries, it narrows the arteries, and it reduces blood supply. But to get a heart attack or stroke, you need a sudden blockage of the artery. And that blockage occurs when the lining cells rupture, like here, and a clot forms on the underlying cholesterol. And the thing that causes the lining cells to rupture is the inflammatory response. So what we're seeing here is a socially driven pattern of psychological negativity, disordered fat handling that's leading to activation of an inflammatory response that ultimately makes us more liable to have heart attacks and strokes. This is American data relating C-reactive protein level to risk of myocardial infarction and heart attack. Threefold, when you take a population split into four quartiles, there's a threefold difference in risk between highest and lowest. And the interesting thing is that statins, the drugs that people get to lower their cholesterol, is one of the power most powerful blockers of the inflammatory response. That's probably working in two different ways. And it's probably statins that have contributed most to that big decline in Finnish and Scottish heart attack rates. That plus probably reductions in some of them. The other thing that CRP predicts for is risk of type 2 diabetes. There are 5,000 West of Scotland men, men in the highest CRP quintile, were 10 times as likely over a five year period to be diagnosed with diabetes as men in the lowest CRP quintile. And we know the reason for that. The reason is abdominal fat. These are the stores that we developed to allow us to chase our animals across the African savanna. They're different from subcutaneous fat stores in that they are much more rapid turnover fatty acids that go to fuel the muscles to allow us to chase the animals. But they, these cells also produce these chemicals into leukin 6 and TNF-alpha that act on the liver to activate the inflammatory response. So what we're seeing is an upregulation of the body's defense mechanisms, if you like. People lower down the social skill of activation these bodily defense mechanisms. So what's causing that? How does that happen? And the best way I've got of explaining that is to show you my monkeys. They're not my monkeys. <coughs> in case in fact, we'd never be allowed to do experiments like this in this country. I got these slides from New York, from a colleague in New York. And these monkeys live in the psychology department of one of the New York universities, where the experiment they do makes baby monkeys depressed, OK? There is no denying that is one depressed baby monkey, okay? Literally turned its face to the wall, not engaged in any way with its mother or siblings. What is it they do that makes these babies <coughs> depressed? It's all down to the way they let mum feed the baby. This is the normal feeding system in the, uh, in the animal house. Metal car, these slots have trays of food in them. And mum, who's playing with the baby, swinging about on the bars and so on, walks across, gets some food, back to baby, baby's fed, no problem. That's the situation in one half of the animal house, and the other half of the animal house, they shut off all the slots, and they leave one open in an inaccessible place, where the mums all have to crowd round, fight with each other to get the food, so they're away from baby a lot longer. <coughs> and it's certainly more stressful for the mothers. And if I were to ask you which group of babies turn out to be depressed, is it ones where mum finds it easy to feed them, or ones where mum has difficulty feeding them, you would naturally say it was the latter group, wouldn't you? And there's nothing in this simple, because it's not. This is stress hormones where mum found it easy to feed them, and this is stress hormones where mum found it hard to feed them, identical. The babies that get elevated stress hormones are where they randomly change the feeding pattern from one day to the next. It's not mum being away that stresses baby, it's him not knowing if mum's going to be there or not. Inconsistency in the feeding process is immensely stressful to the growing baby. 
Not only is it stressful, but it means the babies turn into fat adults. And we know the biological reason for that, too. Because whenever you eat, abdominal fat cells start to fill up with fat. And that's a signal for them to send a hormone called leptin to the brain to switch off hunger. But the leptin can't enter the brain cells, the hunger centers in the brain, because its entry points are blocked if cortisol is elevated. So in stressful situations, you don't switch off hunger. I've, this summer I had two daughters sitting big exams. I couldn't keep them both in chocolate. <laughs> yeah. We know from our own tiny bit of experience that stressful situations, you tend to get the munchies. Well, there's a good biological reason why that is. Now, the mechanism linking that process of inconsistency <laughs> to the outcome, a very profound mechanism. And again, this is a slide from New York, my colleague Bruce McEwen over there. Bruce is a neurobiologist who has shown that babies who experience this inconsistency or other kinds of threat in early life have changes in the way their brain develops in three key areas, frontal lobes, hippocampus, and amygdala. Frontal lobes are executive decision making. You make your clever decisions there and you suppress inappropriate behavior. Frontal lobe loses cell growth. Hippocampus <coughs> integrates short and long term memory and you lose cell growth there. The amygdala is responsible for emotional arousal and you get increased cell growth in the amygdala, increased activity. So what you get is reduced learning capacity, reduced decision-making capacity, specifically reduced suppression of inappropriate behavior, and increased fear, anxiety, aggression. And whenever I talk to teachers, they start to nod at this point. They recognize that in many of their pupils. The key thing is that the hippocampus is the bit of the brain that senses circulating cortisol levels. And what colleagues in Montreal have now shown, and it's been partly replicated at Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, is that babies who experience adverse events in childhood do not make the receptors in the hippocampus that allow them to sense the level of cortisol in the bloodstream. Therefore, they can't send the signals to the adrenals to switch off cortisol production. The genes that code for cortisol receptors in the hippocampus get switched off and are hypothesis is that 50% of the children of those babies will also inherit the gene in the switched off state. And domestic violence, for example, has been shown to switch off these genes. So the sort of toxic effects of domestic violence last potentially more than a generation. That's how complex brain growth is at birth. Explosive growth between there and five or six. And then the bits of the brain that aren't being used get pruned away. And if you're not making your clever decision-making bits of the brain, but you are using the bits of the brain that make you emotionally very aroused, then the first lot will die, the second lot will remain. The process by which that happens, we think, is attachment. <coughs> if you think about it, what's the consistency in a baby's life when it's born? Well, the one consistent thing is when it's hungry, it cries, and it gets fed. It cries, mum will pick them up, cuddle them, there, 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 feed, 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 stress goes away. And by the time that's happened a couple of thousand times, <coughs> baby begins to get the message. Well, this stressy thing that I feel in my stomach, if I do the crying thing, it goes away because that nice lady comes and feeds me. I'm in control of this. And he gradually learns more and more sophisticated ways of controlling people. So I'm oh, 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 you like that too, I'll do more of that. <laughs> He's beginning to learn that the world is a controllable and predictable place. Sometimes he gets fed, but sometimes he doesn't because mum's drunk or under the influence of drugs. Or even worse, mum's boyfriend picks him up and shakes him because he doesn't know what to do with a crying baby because he's never seen positive parenting. Baby gets the message that the world is not a predictable place, that it's dangerous and he has no control. And the genes start to get switched off appropriately that allow him to upregulate his defense mechanisms. 
<coughs> the rate and the pattern of brain growth points to the first three or four years of life. I mean, the, the neurobiologists argue amongst themselves about the rate of which, I mean, since we all sat down here, and I reckon if there'd been 10 new brain cells developed amongst the lot of us, <laughs> that would be it. <laughs> per second, the number of new <coughs> brain connections that take place in a baby's brain at this point is probably in the hundreds of thousands. It's an explosive growth, and all these connections take place in response to what the baby experiences. Now, I'll skip over some of these now because I've got stuff I want to get into shortly. One of the things I've done in Glasgow, we've replicated a lot of these findings in affluent and private glass regions. And one of the things that we've done is psychometric testing to see if the structural changes we've found in the brain map onto the functional changes in the shown by the psychometric test. Choice reaction time tests uh, frontal cortex activity. Your ability to decide when, you know, it's like doing video games. When the baggie walks across in front of you, you've got to decide quickly you're going to shoot him or is that a woman pushing, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. What we've shown is that there's a gap in reaction time in these tests of about 150 milliseconds between affluent and deprived glass regions. In practical terms, what that translates into is two cars driving at 50 miles an hour child walks out in front of them, the car being driven by the guy at the bottom of the social scale will take one to two car lengths longer to stop because he takes that length of time to process the new information before he reacts. There are practical <coughs> applications of this stuff. Adversity in early life. The evidence is overwhelming that we need to do everything we can to stop it. The ACE study, Adverse Childhood Events Study, carried out in middle class California amongst individuals who can afford to buy membership of Kaiser Permanente Insurance System, so these are not poor people, looked at the impact of these nine different types of adverse events in a child's life and subsequent psychosocial <coughs> outcomes. What this shows is that a child who experiences four or more of these adverse events is about seven and a half times more likely to become an alcoholic than a child who experiences none of them. And there are some biological mechanisms involved in that. This graph shows that a boy who experiences physical abuse as a baby is eight times as likely to beat up his girlfriend when he's a teenager. Domestic violence is handed down from generation to generation. He's about three and a half times as likely to be arrested for carrying weapons as a boy who didn't experience that. Girls who experience five or more adverse events are significantly more likely to become <coughs> pregnant as a teenager. <coughs> Developmental delay just stacks up the more adverse events you experience. There's no one of these adverse events worse than any others, they're just cumulative. And the more adverse events you experience, the more likely you are to develop heart disease prematurely. The mechanism of upregulation of the stress response leading to these biological consequences as well as social consequences. And we're seeing it in big population studies, Dunedin cohort, 1,000 children recruited in the South Island of New Zealand, the 1970s, followed up for 40 years. Those who were living in chaotic circumstances as children had all these adverse social outcomes, got elevated CRPs, elevated cortisols, and early signs of a pre-diabetic state. The cancer stuff's really interesting. What leads to this increased propensity to cancer? What I've described is how heart disease occurs. <coughs> Your DNA, has these things at the end of it. Your chromosomes have these wee yellow dots at the end called telomeres. They're the repair bits. Whenever your cells divide, the strands of <coughs> DNA float apart. The telomeres donate bits of themselves to repair the ends of the DNA. And you can measure the length of the telomeres. And we've measured the length of telomeres in affluent the private glass regions. But a, a more elegant study was this one. 
which our study is consistent with. What they did was they took identical twins who were separated at birth and brought up in a different class of households. Twins brought up in an affluent household had significantly longer telomeres than twins brought up in a poor household. Their telomeres had to work harder to repair DNA damage that occurred as they grew up. And damaged DNA is what predisposes you to risk of cancer. They adjusted telomere length for the prevalence of obesity, smoking, exercise, and they were able to narrow the gap by about 30%. 70% of the gap remained, being driven by this chronic upregulation of metabolism that has occurred as a result of the social conditions. So what are we going to do about it? So the last bit of this talk. Einstein said, insanity is always doing the same old thing and expecting different results. Past 50 years we've seen progressive widening of the gap in Scotland. We've got to do things differently. What we have done is we've arranged our public services to deal with need, identify problems in people's lives and meet those gaps. In doing so, we make them passive recipients of services, doing things to people rather than having them in control. And there have been lots and lots of projects, the whole community development um, ethos that's been out there has tried to do, do different things, but it's never really happened. And I think we have an opportunity now to really make it work by turning around the notion of dealing with people's deficits to activating their assets. What are the things that Antonovsky would have recognized in those children that allowed them um, to act as protective and promoting diapers that offered them against life stresses? What was it that kept them under control? And a great example of this would be down the road in Ratloch, where it would be dead easy to define Ratloch in terms of its needs poverty, unemployment, alcohol, drugs, whatever. But actually, isn't it much better to start defining the children of Ragnarok as great musicians? To begin to see the glass half full rather than half empty, because those children will have self-esteem, an enhanced sense of their ability to be in control of their lives, and skills that are being manifestly demonstrated. What it's very obvious to me in looking at the organizations that work from an assets approach is this. It starts off by building trusting relationships. You go into a social work department, you've got a social worker with a caseload, and she's busy, and she's got rules, and she's got risk management protocols that have to be followed, and she's got bureaucracy. You go into your average third sector organization, so come in, have a cup of tea. How can we help? And you may not be ready to talk, but they'll still be there next week, the week after, the week after that. And I've gathered any number of stories about the way this model works. Build trusting relationships. That leads into the opportunity for a transformative change in the individual, where they begin to discover strengths that they never knew they had, perhaps. They get support to put those skills into practice. In doing so, they develop a social network, and connecting people to each other seems to be the thing that makes the difference. As I say, I don't have the statistics around this, but I've got the stories. And we need to start telling those stories more often. What I think is happening is that we've allowed Scotland to be <coughs> dominated by systems. That's a system. Recognize it. Yeah, just about everything we interact with is designed <coughs> like that. It's designed to have a few people control lots of people. It's designed to produce things, whether they be goods or services. But if you're going to produce goods or services, you need people to need those goods or services. So what systems do is they create need. <coughs> whether it be McDonald's, trying to flog you their hamburgers, or whether it be a social work department that needs need to be out there, that needs to define <coughs> communities in terms of needs for its services. 
that's, that's an issue. I mean, I'm not against systems. When I fly up from London, I don't want a committee steering me. <laughs> okay? Systems are all right in their place, but what's the alternative? What's the alternative to surrounding ourselves with systems that deliver things to us in their own way and, and need to have that control over our wants? And the guy who's most interested in this is this book, Alexis de Tocqueville, <coughs> who went to the US from France in the first half of the 19th century and wrote this book, Democracy in America. And he, you know, he, what he found astonished him because Europe was basically governed by aristocracies until the French did away with them at the encouragement of the Scots, I may say. Rousseau, a quote always used in England is Rousseau saying, we look to Scotland for all our ideas of civilization, <laughs> where they tried to put in place a meritocracy. And what he found was he described America as being dominated by associations, fundamentally motivated by the pursuit of wealth, but it was basically citizens getting together to identify problems and fix them. Now, there's a very clever man they talk about. <laughs> One of the quotes I found about them, the American Republic will endure until the day this Congress discovers that the bribe the public with the public's money. He goes on to say, once that money runs out, the fiscal system will collapse and democracy will be replaced by dictatorship. Well, the prime ministers of Greece, Spain, and Italy are not democratically elected. Hitler wasn't democratically elected when the fiscal system collapsed in Germany. De Tocqueville was very smart. The other thing he said about democracies was the two things that they're very bad at, starting a war and ending one. And we'll see that too. But the point was, he said, citizens coming together to fix problems were probably better than what went before. They were able to do these things create capacity within individuals and put them in control, put them in the driving seat. Now the system always reacts. It's got a number of ploys for reacting. Outreach, we will go and explain why we want to shut this hospital or whatever, you know, system outreach. Partnership, that's what the drug industry does to doctors. <coughs> we'll find partnership, i.e. You'll buy a few dinners and you'll use our drugs to be one at its most cynical. Community consultation. Flipboard. I very good. You know, you know, you know all these things. Reality is that what we've got to do is roll back the influence of organizations that are designed to do things to people, to allow people to decide their own futures. And we're beginning to see that in some of the most deprived parts of Scotland, where the results are just extraordinary. I'll skip on. So why is this not the big society? Well, again, this is something I love to show ministers down in England. Everyone here knows who this guy is. Anyone not know who Jimmy Reed is? Put your hand up if you don't know who Jimmy Reed is. Shame on you. <laughs> Jimmy Reid was a communist shop steward in Upper Clyde Shipbuilders in Govan in Glasgow in the 1960s when the Heath government wanted to shut down shipbuilding on the Clyde. And Jimmy Reid did an unusual thing. He didn't take the workers out on strike. He took them in to work. He had a work in. He literally took them in and locked the gates. And he has a tremendous rhetoric. There's still, I think there's still a bit on YouTube of him with his famous instructions to the workers, there will be nay vandalism, there will be nay debbying, you know, you are here to work. And he saved ship, there's still shipbuilding in the Clyde as a result of Jimmy Reed's actions. Now, of course, Scottish universities have Lord Rectors, and when this happened, I was a medical student at Glasgow University, and of course, we elected Jimmy Reed, Lord Rector of Glasgow University. And the New York Times published his rectorial address in full and called it the single most important piece of public rhetoric since the Gettysburg Address. A Glasgow communist up there with Abraham Lincoln, what to be proud of. His, uh, and one of the current 
board, health board chief executives was the vice president of the student representative council that day, and he had to get up and give the reply to the speech. He <laughs> says it was just a staggering experience. His rectorial address was about alienation. The cry of men who believe themselves the victims of blind economic forces beyond their control, the frustration of ordinary people excluded from the processes of decision making, the feeling, feeling of despair and hopelessness that feels with some justification that they have no real say in shaping or determining their own destinies. It's just what all these studies have shown. Lack of control, hopelessness about the future, he went on to say, this is why people turn to drink and drugs. And what we have seen in the most deprived communities of Scotland is increasing alienation from society. One of my colleagues recently showed the latest data on Glasgow to a professor of public health in Sydney, Australia. He looked at it and he said, that's what we see in the ab ab Aboriginal population. Dislocation from a traditional way of life and until we can give these communities back a sense of self-respect, self-esteem, control over their lives, we're not going to be able to turn around the smoking and the drugs and so on. They may be causes of ill health, but it's the causes of the causes that we need to tackle. And that requires a major rethink in the way Scottish society works. I probably won't be able to see it that if we can kick something off that begins to give people a sense that they can be in control, then I think we'll have started something significant. Thanks very much.